Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report live for hour number three on the Tuesday, August 14th show is Johnson Gray. Johnson, are you there? Yes, Bill. <clears throat> How are you today? We covered a tremendous amount of territory last week, and I'm hoping we can be just as effective this week. Uh, let's start off with the uh, amazing book, of course, the uh, the Forbidden Secret, which you, they can obtain it e- as an e-book at beforeus.com. So what chapter are we up to now? We're up to chapter 28 today, Bill. And we'll be, we'll be discussing the person of Jesus, actually. Um, there are is a popular view out there that Jesus was a great philosopher, but he was nothing more than that. And uh, his teachings are wonderful, but um, and, uh, he's not uh, God in the flesh. I think yeah, we must deal with that one today. Yeah, I know it's funny. I actually had a gentleman that called in by the name of Richard from Washington, made the statement. I couldn't believe it that he actually made the statement that <clears throat> there was no evidence that Jesus existed, that, <clears throat> that he was a fictitious element that was created by historians and the religious elite at the time of thinking there's more evidence that Jesus existed than you and I right now live on the air. Absolutely. And speaking as an investigative scientist, I can tell you that the evidence is greater than I even thought. Uh, the more we go into it, the, the more solid and, and substantial it becomes. And by the way, it's not just biblical, it's extra biblical as well. We have uh, Roman historians and others that have proven this and other records from other countries that are, have nothing to do with the Bible. And even people that are, you know, Roman historians that are secular or they believe in their polytheistic gods, they actually document the presence of Jesus and what happened there in many different records that are in the, this book, The Forbidden Secret, is one of the great sources they can find of this information. They'll find quite a lot of that documentation in the book, yes, Bill. Um, and there's a lot more as well. Outside. Right, and there are many other books that you carry as well that uh, kind yeah. of reference this information, which if people want to dig into the the, the ancient libraries and so on that go around the world, uh, and of course also the attempts to try to pervert the scriptures, you know, uh, they don't understand that the Jews didn't accept Jesus, so they tried to accept Jesus Bar, Bar Kokhba uh, sometime later, and then of course when the Romans executed him, they uh, said, oh well, I guess he wasn't the Messiah, so... Of course, the apostate uh, Jewish rabbis were either the uh, Pharisees or Sadducees or other cultic subgroups. They went off and eventually became the Sabbatean uh, <coughs> uh, Luciferians that are, by and large, the, a large number of the, of the Jews are the ones that become secular agnostics, uh, especially since the Second World War, actually descendants from these ancient Pharisees that were apostate, that didn't accept their own Messiah when it was prophesied right in their own scriptures, which rabbis that are really good we call academicians, can prove to each other that it was in the ancient scriptures, it's in the star signs, and it's in extra-biblical documents that go back uh, thousands of years. Yes, uh, and I'll speak of an extra-biblical document in the future because we've laid our hands on one here which is not known to the world yet. Right, and, and uh, that's one you're, you're not going to mention necessarily today. No, we won't talk about that today. Uh, I, I think we've got something very important to talk about today, and we'll stick to that. Okay, sounds good. Let's roll. Okay. I'd like, I'd like to look at this from several angles, uh, Bill. Um, first of all, his words. His words are a puzzling paradox. And one, one thing stands out about uh, Yeshua, uh, whom we know as Jesus, is the, the things he spoke. Very easy to remember, yet very, very profound. And I found that uh, the most um, intelligent professors uh, find great depth in what he says, greater than what they find anywhere else, and yet little children can still understand those very same words. Now, that is something that is unparalleled in history. Right, and this is, by the way, we're up on chapter 28 of the book of those of people who are following along who have the e-book already. Uh, chapter 28, is that right? That's right, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Now, let's get this clear, that Jesus was not a political activist. He knew that the problem was in the hearts of men, and he worked on the heart. That was his focus. Right, and in other words, if you're going to build a wall, and you're a, a uh, as it says, a living stone wall, the stones are us, the souls of those, uh, whether or not they're in alignment with the spirit and the will of the Most High God, or they're not. And uh, he was trying to transform the hearts because no matter what political system you have, if you don't have transformed hearts that serve the Most High God first and then they uh, have equal care for their neighbors themselves, you can't build a civilization of any uh, length, no matter what technology, that's going to be that's going to stand for any length of time before it destroys itself. True. Yes. 
And to estimate his influence on history, we should consider the difference between Yeshua and all the philosophers and the moralists of history. Now, you, you, to gather all their wise and good precepts, you must first find it necessary to sift out all the error, which is very obviously found in their writings, the immorality and the absurd superstition. And that's an enormous job. And the fact is that a single person, unlearned in man's wisdom, not going to any of the schools of his day, not only opposed the practices and the maxims of his own country, but he formulated a system that's admittedly superior to anything else on the planet today. Right. And uh, I have gathered uh, statements from other skeptics. I mean, I, I lived the life of a skeptic for several decades, Dr. Bill, as I think I've mentioned before. Right. But I'd like to just quote a few other skeptics and, and what they have said about Yeshua before we go much further. Uh, we take, for example, uh, former Yale historian Kenneth Scott Latourette. He said, as the centuries pass, the evidence is accumulating that measured by his effect on history, Jesus is the most influential life ever lived on this planet. And he speaks of the baffling mystery that no other life lived on this planet has evoked such a huge volume of literature among so many peoples and languages that far from ebbing, the flood continues to mount. And so... Um, we, we could go down to, to Ram, for example, the greatest words ever spoken, he says. Shaft, he shed more light on things human and divine than all the philosophers and scholars combined. And another skeptic called Thomas, he said, to see since the days of Christ, in spite of all the progress of thought, not a single new ethical idea has been given to the world. So certainly, if God became man, then we would expect his words would be the greatest ever spoken, wouldn't we? Exactly, yeah. And the, most, and the most simple, so that the simplest person could understand them. Yes, certainly. And when you compare the doctrines of Plato and Socrates, Aristotle and so on, you can sense a difference between their words and Christ's. It's a difference between an inquiry, a searching, and a revelation. Yeah. These men all looked. At, if, if you read their writings, you can see that they're searching for truth. They're searching for the for the the basis of everything. Whereas Jesus came and said, "This is. I'm revealing it to you." That's a big difference. Yeah. In other words, his statements were declarative and simple and logical, and there's no uh, logical inconsistency in the portions of his statement. No, that's absolutely right. Now. Socrates taught for 40 years. Aristotle taught for 40 years also. Plato for 50. Okay, here's four men, three men, 40 and 40 and 50. 80, 130 years of teaching between the three of them. And yet the three years of Jesus' teaching surpass in influence worldwide the combined 130 years of these three greatest men of history. Now that says something, doesn't it? Surely. It, it, it certainly does. It also changes the position of, you know, the big questions of what is the universe, what, who is God, uh, what is his interest in man, and what is man? And Jesus answers all of those questions with no other historian or philosopher, where the people that believe in reincarnation, the people that believe in, in uh, all kinds of other isms, where Jesus just gives us a, a plain answer. Yeah, very plain. Yeah. And it makes so much sense, too. Okay, now, he did make some preposterous claims. People talk about him being a, a good man and a great philosopher, etc. Well, I'm going to ask some, some piercing questions on this because uh, I think we have to get to the heart of it. Exactly. He made seemingly impossible assertions and promises. Uh, we'll get on to this after the break. I can uh, hear the music rolling, and we'll be back in a moment with Jonathan Gray. Beforeus.com. Stay tuned. back with uh, Jonathan Gray. The uh, website is beforeus.com. Uh, Jonathan, I'm sure you're getting a great response when people uh, read your books. Uh, let's get into these issues, these you know, these pronouncements, because we hear from uh, cultic dangerous groups like the Mormons 
and Islam to try to state that Jesus is either the brother of Satan with the Mormons or that he's just another great prophet, but he had to have a kind of Muhammad to come after him to kind of straighten things out. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth because the actual statements in the Bible, which people that say they're, they're Muslims and accept the Quran, they say, oh yeah, we believe in the Bible. No, if you believe the Bible, there are specific scriptures here that make statements that makes fools of Muhammad and Joseph Smith and any other cult leader that tries to pretend that Jesus said anything other than the fact that he was the incarnation of the Father in the flesh on earth. That's it. He's not, he's, he's not, he's not another prophet. Like these and promises that yeah. would normally brand a man either a liar, a preposterous liar, or a mad fanatic. But let's see what some of the statements are that he made. Right. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He said, I am able to give life to whom I wish. I have moral authority over all men. And only I, I alone, can save men. Now, who is this person who places his own authority side by side with the authority of God? It's obvious from these statements alone that he claimed not to be no mere holy man. He claimed uniqueness. Yeah. And uh, according to those who personally heard him teach and wrote the gospel stories, uh, records of his teachings, he said, I am one with God. I am God's only son. I was with the Father before the world was. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, that expression, I am, applies to God alone. Right. The name of God in Hebrew is Yahweh, or I am, the Eternal One. Yep. And he made other audacious claims. He said, you will see me sitting at the right hand of the Father. I am equal with God. Worship is due to me as it is due to the Father. So he commanded and accepted worship as right, God by, by the way, no prophet would, by, would disqualify himself if he ever requested worship. Any prophet that, says, worship the yeah. Father only uh, and thank God that he has sent me, but do not worship me. That's any prophet that is servant of the Most High God would always direct the worship to the Father and to yeah. Yeshua HaMashiach, that's the incarnation of the Father in the flesh. And people get all confused about this. It's really pretty straightforward. Oh, it is, it is straightforward, but of course uh, the Bible does uh, does give us this kind of, of, of understanding that uh, it's a mystery to our minds because we're not used to uh, this situation ourselves. It's a unique situation where God himself comes down to the world, and so it's called a great mystery uh, to us because our minds are no more capable of understanding that intricacies than a cat is to what we're doing today. Well, just think of uh, God as a, as a, uh, as a, a young lad walking through a garden and he, he spies an ant anthill and he decides that he wants to condescend to actually bring the truth to the ants so he actually became an ant and then was killed by the other ants because he raised something that was a blasphemy against all the other ants that's just a small example and it's even greater than that with God with of infinite omniscience omnipotence and omnipresence literally came down to our little world you know, out of 460 trillion galaxies, our little planet and 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone, and yet he condescended to become a little baby in a manger and then die to tell, teach us the way. That's why he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. So when he says that, when you start to kind of walk with God, he speaks to you in circumstances, in the Bible, in your personal walk, both good and bad things. He speaks uh, sometimes in dreams and visions, and he said, I'll pour out my spirit wrong all men before the, the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it's coming. The judgment by water has occurred. The judgment by fire is coming. And if you don't submit to the fire of the Spirit of the Most High God, you will be burnt with the fire that's coming to this planet, this world. Yeah, that, that's obvious. Uh, and we're racing fast toward it. Yeah, and it doesn't now, mean it's the end of mankind, but it means the end of this age. Many people who don't accept this truth are just going to be removed from the gene pool. They're not going to be here. Uh, and they don't just suffer the physical death, they suffer what's called the spiritual death. A lot of people have this, and it says it very plainly in the Bible, your soul, unless it is married to the spirit of the Most High God, is not eternal. It's destroyed. It will, it's annihilated. It, will it cease ceases to exist. To, it, it ceases it will cease to, to exist. exist. What, a, what a terrible way to think that uh, loved ones of yours may continue on, but your memory will be totally forgotten. Uh, that's right. a very sad situation, isn't it? 
Right, and the people should understand that. They should have a they should have a grieving. That's why the desperateness of trying to get the truth out to people, they're not just going to have to suffer a physical death where they go on the ground and say, Oh well eventually even people might be feel kind of some sense of, well, they're gonna be okay, they're going to hell. No, they're not going to hell, they're going to annihilation. Because the place of, yeah. of the of destruction is a place of internal destruction. They're gone. They cease yeah. to exist. Uh, unfortunately, there are religious leaders who are preaching that you, you burn in hell forever, and this has caused many, many atheists. This false theory has been blamed against pure Christianity, but it doesn't belong in the Christian teaching or in the Bible. Well, first off, God does never not condemn anyone. All God does is accept your free will to decide to have a relationship with him or not. In fact, God doesn't even judge the flesh. It says in the Bible he judges the spirit only, and all he does is accept your free will, because to become a son or daughter of the Most High, you have to have free will, and he'll even allow and accept your free will to literally go into destruction. That's how great God is. Well, we've just been looking at some of the statements that Jesus, uh, Yeshua, made, and as if, as if that was not enough, Dr. Bill, he actually made a prediction. He said, I will judge the world, and I will arouse the dead. Right. Now, that was a claim to divinity, and it was recognized as such by those who heard him. Uh, Jesus is the only religious leader who has ever claimed to be God. Right. And here he was making the incredible claim that he... The son of a, the legal son of a simple carpenter among the shavings and the sawdust of his father's workshop was in reality God in the flesh. And he never guessed, he never supposed his teachings were ultimate, they were final. And he was crucified not for anything he did. The issue was his identity. Right. And this is unique among criminal trials. He was crucified for blasphemy, for saying that he was God. And um, indeed, unless he were equal to God, his words were, blas were blasphemy. He was also uh, crucified for healing on the Sabbath and performing miracles, which proved, uh, with the sign gifts, that he actually was who he said he was. He was who he, he said he was. Even his statements, the, uh, the rabbis were completely befuddled because he didn't know how to counter it because it lined up with the Torah exactly and it was swept away all their their vain imaginings that were confusions of the torah and what it meant in its essential uh, facts and it was so plain that the common people accepted it gladly and easily because it didn't make sense right of course that's part of the reason why even the modern catholic church had head up until i think 1878 where if you read the bible without a priest there you could actually commit a mortal sin and go to hell so they, it's like the ancient rabbis, they want to have all their fancy readings so that unless the rabbi interpreted at the local synagogue, you were not to read the scriptures alone. And of yeah. course, Jesus changed that completely. He made it democratized to say, everyone can come to the Father. Amazing. Yeah. What a radical. Of course, he's God. Pretty easy for God. Back in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, you know, my little daughter with 19 years of age with Down syndrome can understand the gospel that Jesus gave when we get talked to her simply. I remember the first time when she was not even yet walking at a year and a half, and she said grace at our table, and she says, Jesus, you see mommy, and you see daddy, and she went through all her brothers, Matthew, Stephen, and Chris. How beautiful. And you can see the tears running down her face, realized her spirit knew because she could see in the spirit realm, she could see God. And you know, people don't realize that. I had an interesting uh, uh, story sent to me about a little native boy. Well, one of the, the passages they put the native boys through is that they would blindfold them and they'd be all night on the stump and they, they were not allowed to run or scream or do anything to pull the mask off. And uh, next morning when the sunlight came up, the father was reading next door. Well, that's the same picture uh, as God. God is there with us. We have no idea how many disasters we've avoided, how many thermonuclear exchanges, how many bioweapon releases, how many economic chaos, how much horror and death we've already avoided because God intervened because he doesn't want one to perish, not just physically, because God can resurrect a body, but spiritually to literally to perish. And our civilization is one that God wants to be around here. 
10,000, a million years from now, God wants a descendant of mankind on this world and other worlds across the galaxy and the cosmos that worship and know the Most High God. He wants mankind to spread across the stars that know the Creator God, has a relationship, will not do evil because they have a constant ongoing relationship no matter how much technology they have if they control the power of a black hole and a star and a galaxy like Michio Kaku talks about that they know and as they say the advanced civilizations across the universe they have an ever-present knowledge that our God the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob the God of this universe 460 trillion galaxies in our own little local bubble called our universe and there's infinite universes that the Creator God has made that He's God there's no such thing as atheism in an advanced civilization. It doesn't exist. Because science screams out that there's a creator. Science screams out that there's a spiritual realm above all of this, isn't there? Yes. It, what a tremendous destiny is in store for us, if, if, for those who maintain and develop a relationship with the creator. Right. What Satan, Satan wants is he wants mankind to have a quick and, and, and nasty death with a thermal, nuclear, biological, chemical, chemical, and scalar war, and if there are galactic and cosmic events happening, there could be extinction-level events, not to avoid them, not to come together as a civilization to fight them with the inspiration of the Most High God to use the best of our technologies to avoid asteroid impacts and coronal mass ejections and harden our power grid. No, no, not to take care of our fellow man of any nation, but to come together to destroy each other. That's what Satan wants. That's why he set up all this dialectic of destruction to make sure every nation has adequate weapons to kill the others. Yep. Okay. Now, so, um, C.S. Lewis was a professor of Cambridge University. I think many of us have heard of him. And he was once an agnostic. I'd just like to quote him in what he said. I think I couldn't say it much better than he did. Yeah, he's an he amazing said, a man, guy. Speaking of Jesus Christ, he said, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is God, or else he's a madman or something worse, because he claimed to be God. Right. Let's not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. And I think that's pretty good. Yeah. In other words, Jesus didn't leave any elbow room. No, he didn't. He's either who he claimed to be or else he's not. Right. Okay, now, that leaves us with two alternatives. Let's deal with the first one. Suppose he knew that his claims were false. Now, if this is so, then he made a deliberate misrepresentation, if he knew. He, that means he was a liar, he was a hypocrite, he was a demon. In fact, he was a fool because he died for it. And if he made such claims and none were true, then he was also the most unprincipled deceiver in all history because he told others to trust him for their eternal destiny. He told others even to die for his claims. And if he could not back up his claims and he knew it, then he was unspeakably evil. We've got to call it what it would be. He right. was a liar and a hypocrite because he told others to be honest, whatever the cost, while himself he was teaching and living a colossal lie. Now, I believe there's not one sceptic who will admit he was a deceiver. They do concede he was honest and earnest. But... If he knew that he was not God, and he said he was, a bad man could not have taught such truths as he taught. Truths which, even today, perform miracles of character change. He changed my life. Boy, I'd hate to tell you what I was like before. Uh -huh. And a good man could not have deceived the people for whom he gave his life. So, how in the name of common sense could an imposter have continued to demonstrate from beginning to end what is recognized even by non-believers today as the purest and noblest character in history with the most perfect air of truth and reality. So I would say, Dr. Bill, he could not possibly have been a liar, a fraud. He could not right. have had that influence if he was. Yeah, in other words, you just go through it logically and just like working out an equation and logically deducing it, it's not possible any other to make any other conclusion. If he was... Uh, if the skeptic says he made these statements, he had to, by inference, be a liar and a deceiver and a monstrously evil narcissist 
that created uh, massive destruction through history. And a lot of people say, well, look what the Roman Catholic Church did, killed all these Albigensians and so on. That was not Jesus. The, many things That's have been done in Jesus his name. All, no. no, that was done in his name by an apostate Roman Catholic Church that by that time had completely absorbed much of paganism, uh, just like the ancient Druids, which came were scattered by the Assyrians to the northern tribes across Europe and Germany and all across to the British Isles, which is why the Hebrides, in fact, uh, you're probably familiar with the Book of the Kells that's in, uh, in Ireland, or the, uh, the, the, in Edinburgh Castle, the ancient sticks that are written in Aramaic. The fact is that apostasy entered, just like right now. I was told us when I had my visit by the Pindar many years ago, before my daughter was born, that the Council that rules Earth is a is Druidic Council, it's an apostate. Just like right now, most of the Jews in Israel, whether they're secular agnostics or apostate, there's a tiny fraction of Jews that believe the Torah is prescient over the writings of all these ancient apostate uh, Jews and Hebrews. They don't understand it. Uh, they don't understand that, that God is a God of order, not disorder, and not a, and not a God of, of opinion either. That's the problem, is that everybody's got an opinion. But the prophets made statements. They didn't make statements of opinion. They made statements of declaration. And the declarations had to lock together like the facets of a, of a diamond or a, a puzzle. So they had to interpret, like it says in Second Peter, the Bible interprets itself. It doesn't have private interpretation and God is not a, a recognizer that one person is so brilliant they can figure it out because they can't only the infinite mind of God but they don't want to believe that they want to think that somehow there's great religious leaders that are somehow going to lead us out of this and there's only one and that's the Prince of Peace God himself yeah okay then Jesus either knew his claims, claims were false and if so he was an evil character he couldn't call him good Right, and yet on the other hand, what he taught has transformed people, evil people, into good people. So how could he have been an evil person? Right. Okay, if he knew his claims were false, he was evil. Uh, if he did not know his claims were false, now that's the, that's the second option. He he then he was deluded. He was a lunatic. Well, yes, the, the facts do show that his mind was so keen that it was more than a match for the sharpest intellect of his day when he was in, in discussion with them. Right. So I'd like to ask any skeptic out there today to tell me, how could he be a deluded madman who never lost the even balance of his mind, who sailed serenely over all the troubles and persecutions that were heaped on him, just like the suns above the clouds, who always returned the wisest answer to tempting questions, and who calmly and deliberately made predictions which have been literally fulfilled since. Exactly. Amazing. Back in a moment with Johnson Gray, BeforeUs.com. Important discussion. Everything that's going on has been seen by the Father before the dawn of this creation. Jonathan, when, when you talk about spiritual matters, and people don't believe that there's another parallel world that's in the spiritual realm. They don't believe in spiritual things. They think it's all just a matter of opinion, or that all pathways lead to the same uh, end. Just like the Pope has had ceremonies with the Dalai Lama and Animus and others. Uh, what do you say to people when they say that they, they are, you know, they believe in, the, in materialism and essentialism that basically that only way concretely you can measure in front of you exists. How do you respond to that when you present things like this book? I mean, you've got some amazing documentation here. Well, I, sometimes it depends on the person and how they approach it. Sometimes I will, I will ask them, uh, would it be fair to say that you, you uh, know everything that there is to know in the universe? And, of course, <laughs> the obvious answer will be no. I say, well, it would it be fair to say you know only half of what there is in the universe to know? <laughs> And then I would say, well, could it be that the information that you don't believe is in the other half that you don't know? <laughs> How about one billionth of the one trillionth of the knowledge of the universe? That would be generous. Uh, they don't know anything, as they say, that song, you know, like uh, Charles Dickens had, you know, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge singing, I, I don't know anything. You know, remember that song he sang at the end of the uh, Christmas Carol? 
yeah. uh, realized that he didn't know anything. And that's what the problem is. People are, are bathed and, and, and steeped in their own ignorance, and they don't realize they don't know anything. That is they true. They really don't. Yeah. And, and the more you, you start learning, the more you realize the horizon is still further away than you thought. Right. My father had a saying, he said, when the island of knowledge increases, so does the shoreline of doubt, you start to realize... And also there's pearls of wisdom. If you read your Bible, if you go through experiences, if you start to walk with God, he gives you signposts that he's there. He gives you evidence that he's there. Even through awful things that you go through physically, emotionally, and otherwise, you realize God's there. And as soon as you start to accede to that, he even takes away disasters and, and burdens on you because he's trying to change you, just like you're in the uh, fires of, of a personal tribulation so he can make you a better person, a better spirit being living and walking through this existence. I call this the valley of the shadow of death. You see, they should spank the babies on the bottom at birth and read Psalm 23, not when they die. And when they die, they should read Psalm 911, which is my favorite scripture in the Bible. Interesting. No, Psalm 911. <laughs> okay. Re reverse those. Uh, yeah, and Dr. Bill, we, we just covered two alternatives here for Jesus Christ. Either he knew his claims were false, in which he was not a good person, but he was a fraud. Or secondly, he did not know his claims were false, but was deluded, in which case he was a lunatic. Right. And, and, and we, we, we showed that he was neither a fraud nor a lunatic. First of all, he, the influence of his life on history has refined so many people, and a fraud can't do that. Secondly... Um, he is certainly not a lunatic because he, his mind made the sharpest statements uh, in the face of his enemies and he made predictions that have been literally fulfilled. So he was not a nutcase. He was not a deluded nutcase who didn't know what he was saying was true and he was not a liar uh, because he, he made statements and uh, they, well, the question is now, were his claims true? And it comes right down to that. And in my search for truth over this matter over several years, it came back to this. This person, Jesus, is either everything for mankind or he's nothing. He's either the greatest certainty or he's the greatest fake. And if his claims are true, then I, Jonathan Gray, must either accept or reject his lordship. And there had to be moral honesty about this, I told myself. Jesus prophesied that he would be the great spiritual magnet that would draw men and women of all nations to himself. And, let's face it, that prophecy's come true. Something right. to think about? Yeah, and of course what we have right now is a great... His, enemy, uh, a great... his contemporary enemies bore witness. Yes. We, have, uh, we have Jesus asking his, his personal enemies, which of you convicts me of having done wrong? We have Governor Pilate, the Roman governor, saying, what evil has this man done? We have a criminal who was crucified with him crying out, this man has done nothing wrong. And we have a Roman centurion in charge of the execution, bearing witness, certainly this man was innocent. Surely he was the son of God. Now, we ha it's hard for his enemies to bring forth an ex accusation of wrong. They were unable to do it. Now, it had been claimed that the divine law was unreasonable and could not be obeyed by men and women, yet Jesus kept it. Taking human nature, standing as man's representative, he proved that man, filled with God's spirit, could obey every divine requirement. He demonstrated that God's laws were given to men and women in love. He showed us what it's like to have heaven in the heart. And uh, far from denying his miracles, Jesus' enemies attributed them to the power of evil. And uh, we were talking about historical evidence earlier. You know, it, I think it's of great historical value that his enemies actually wrote about his miracles. The Jewish Babylonian Sanhedrin, which is accessible today, says, On the eve of Passover they hanged Jesus of Nazareth. He hath practiced sorcery and beguiled and led astray Israel. And then we have uh, a Roman emperor, Julian, saying, Jesus did nothing in his lifetime worthy of fame unless anyone thinks it's a great work to heal lame and blind people and, take, and cast out demons. And Justin Martyr, 
uh, referring to the Roman official Roman records, 150 AD, said this, that he performed these miracles, you may easily be satisfied by the acts of Pontius Pilate sent into the archives of the Emperor of Rome. So there we have evidence, just a, a few samples of evidence for people who knew him or were very close to his time admitting that Jesus did what he is recorded in the New Testament as having done and taught. So his miracles did demonstrate power over nature, power over disease, power over demons and power over death, as well as powers of creation. And it was so ordinary to him, it seemed to be a nat natural outcome of his life. And yet that was only a small part of his ministry. And uh, they were done in public, the miracles. For example, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, it's significant that his enemies did not deny the miracle, but rather they tried to kill him before all men believed in him. They tried to kill Lazarus before all men would believe on Jesus. Right. In other words, or they try to attribute it to evil. You know that he used Beelzebub to buy the power of Beelzebub, the <laughs> the chief of demons. He was actually doing these things. They didn't deny that they did them. He just they tried to twist it and say no. He because he's a great demon. He's got power over lesser demons. Yes, yes, that's true. Well, now I, I think in the short time we've got, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. One is that he loved everyone. Never would there ever be someone on earth so kind as he, so generous, so helpful, so lovely, or even so loving. Uh, while hating the wrong, he wept with compassion over every wrongdoer. And he was able to be on the side of the sinner without ever once condoning the sin. I think that was very wonderful. Yeah. And though he was not soft on sin, he, he said he had come to heal the brokenhearted, not to create new hurts, he was sensitive to the feelings of others. He never embarrassed anyone needlessly or exposed a guilty one publicly. He associated with the rejected. He approached the frustrated people with compassion. Look, he went down to the seamy places of the cities where the prostitutes were kept and told them that God loved them, that he'd forgive their sins and make them dignified women again. There was none on earth like him gracious, lovely, and he made everything so simple to understand. I think the greatest thing he did was he, apart from dying for us and taking our place and taking our sins from us, if we would accept it, he proved that God was all-powerful, but just, a kind and a loving and merciful God. And uh, it seems that just being near him would make a person want to be good. And so he was here with us for a time, how better could he have communicated with us than become one of us, as you said, becoming a little ant, that understand, and uh, he gave us that understanding by becoming one with us. He gave us yeah. the understanding of what God is like. He gave us the understanding of what a perfect life can be. And he went so far as to state that if anyone declared himself to be without sin, he was a liar. Right, because the only way to do good, and I repeat this, is not... You can only do good if you know and do the will of the Father, and anything other than that is by definition evil. That's how yeah. simple it is. Simply be quiet, listen to the conscience, pray, read your Bible, listen to the voice of the Most High God and the experiences and so on, and walk with God. And life will become not easier, but it'll become real. Wonderful. Amazing program. We're getting back next week with Jonathan Gray. You don't want to miss it.